Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to join you once, once again here in the uh, Oxbow uh, Second Fellowship for Research, uh, Dissemination, and Teaching for our beloved Palestinian deputies. Okay, today I'm going to speak a little bit about evidence-based medicine, uh, what it's it, uh, why we need it and how to practice it. But in the time constraint, I'm just going to uh, give highlights for each headings. Okay, evidence-based medicine as uh, defined originally uh, by David Sackett and uh, Goyet as the consensuous and judicious integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. Uh, the original definition was a bit longer and the newer dis uh, definitions was a bit shorter. So I mixed them together and just uh, put all three components together. Uh, best research evidence, best clinical expertise and best patient values and preferences. Evidence-based medicine aims to alert all clinicians to valid and important research advances from original and review articles in different medical specialties and subspecialties. The main goal of evidence-based medicine is to improve patient clinical care, so less people are dying, to improve the public health, so the mass majority of the people in every locality or every nation have a better health, and for a better health policy. Thus, the overall goal of evidence-based medicine is to improve the quality of life. Evidence-based medicine relies on two main fundamental principles. First is the hierarchy of evidence. Second is the insufficiency of evidence alone. If we look in the first one, the hierarchy of evidence, not all evidence are equal. So we have weak evidence, we have strong evidence, we have moderate evidence, and we have doubtful evidence, we have valid evidence. But if we take a look in this lovely colorful pyramid, we can see that at the bottom of it are in vitro research or test tube research. And just to remind our beloved audience and viewers that in vitro research or test tube research is the first step before producing any drug or vaccine or whatsoever, like what's happening now with the Pfizer vaccine, AstraZeneca vaccine, Moderna and others. They start doing this inside the laboratory using first test tubes to test the efficacy of antibiotics, or antifungal or something, then they go one step higher and testing that product or that vaccine on animals. So they test it on guinea pigs, on monkeys, in cats. Then this pool of evidence might come into opinions, expert opinions. So they will produce some sort of uh, consensus. This, this protocol has been agreed by so-called number of experts. And usually when we hear the word experts, we tend to believe the authenticity and validity of this evidence. But to be honest with you, expert opinion remains at the bottom of the level of evidence. So it is one of the weakest source of evidence. After that, we have all different research designs from case reports to case series, to case control, followed by cohort studies. The higher we go up, the more stronger the evidence until we reach the gold standard of research, which is randomized control, double blinded studies. This kind of research design is considered to be the gold standard, so it is the best. Then on top of all of them, we have systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Putting them on this different positions from bottom to top doesn't mean that a systematic review is always better than a randomized controlled trial. No, this is not true because a systematic review that has been based on weak studies is weaker than a randomized controlled trial that has been done 
based on the best standard of practice and has been reported honestly and has been uh, analyzed to the best knowledge and to the best standards of research conducted. Second fundamental uh, uh, pillar of evidence-based medicine is the insufficiency of evidence alone. We cannot rely totally on research findings to guide our decision-making. We need to take into consideration the vast clinical experience of doctors in their localities. And also we have to take into consideration the patient values and preference. So evidence-based medicine built on, but not replaces clinical judgment and experience. For example, the best evidence says that doing cholecystectomy using laparoscope is better than doing cholecystectomy using the traditional surgery. But if the doctor who's going to do the surgery is not experienced in doing laparoscope, so the best evidence for this particular patient is to go with the traditional surgery because I don't have the enough expertise in conducting this surgery. Another example, if I have the expertise and the best evidence says that laparoscopic surgery is better than the traditional surgery to remove the gallbladder. But the patient is so, so afraid that there might be some complications, uh, the price is too high. So he said, no, no, I don't want to go with this more evidence tool. I don't want to go with laparoscopic surgery. I want to go with the traditional surgery to be in the safe hand. So we have to respect it. So if I put together the best research evidence with my clinical expertise and taking into consideration the patient values and expectation, then I'm applying evidence-based medicine. Why we need to learn evidence-based medicine? Because there are lots of variations in clinical practice. What I'm doing to treat stroke in my locality or my hospital is different from what is being done in the other hospital. What I'm doing to treat tension headache in my clinic is different from what's being done in the next clinic. There is also a big gap between research and practice. Research, research is, is saying something and practice on the ground is saying an opposite. Let me cite one example. I was just in a meeting with decision makers in, in Minister of Health some weeks ago. And when we were discussing about the use of Dethromycin, I found that it is the main pillar of the protocol of treating COVID-19 patients. But we have now evidence from the recovery trial of, uh, run by WHO saying that azithromycin has no significant effect to reduce mortality or shorten hospital stay or improve patient condition unless the patient is having pneumonia or whatsoever. There is over-reliance on experience and expert opinion. There is uncritical acceptance of research findings. Once somebody reads a research finding and says that this a drug, let's say Evermectin is effective, this is a magic drug like what Frontline Doctors Alliance in America is saying, then many people will adopt that thing without critical appraisal of these findings. There are many ineffective treatments are still adopted till this moment. About 40% of our decisions are not supported by any evidence. And lastly, but most importantly, pharmaceutical companies influence some of our clinical decisions, if not many. The importance of evidence-based medicine arises from four main facts. We need to be up to date all the time about bit better diagnosis, better prognosis, better therapy, better prevention. Our knowledge declines with time, from time of graduation. The traditional resources are usually out of date like textbook. If I purchase Harrison textbook, that is 2021 edition, this book, in reality, it is eight years old. What has been written in that textbook is seven to eight years old. Frequently wrong expert opinion, ineffective didactic teaching, publish 
articles are too many. They are overwhelming and sometimes contradictory. And after all, we have no time to find this valid evidence amongst hundreds of thousands of papers. Yearly, we have more than 3.5 million papers published in more than 5,000 biomedical and medical journals. Just daily, we have more than 7,000 articles published in one biomedical journal. In Medline, we have more than 2,500 up to 3,000 indexed every day in the PubMed. We have more than 100 trials being published every day and more and more and more. And unfortunately, many more end up in the trash can. So if I'm looking for evidence in the middle of 3 million articles, it will be hard for me to find the evidence in real time. And we have some examples of the benefit of evidence-based medicine practice to humanity. One example is the corticosteroid for preterm birth. Prior to 1980s, hundreds of kids die every day in different places due to preterm delivery. And in, two, in 1982, uh, a trial, uh, sorry, a review of uh, research has been done and they found seven randomized controlled trials comparing the administration of corticosteroid versus no administration for women with premature delivery. And what they found that all these trials favors the corticosteroid administration for women in the 29th or 30th week of gestation, because if they were giving these three simple shots, the baby life will be saved. And since then, this has been the protocol. And just imagine how many hundreds or thousands of children died every day because we haven't apply the best available evidence. Also patching of the eyes after corneal surgeries. Before, after patient has been operated in the cornea, they advise him to cover his eye for two or three weeks away from dust or from air or any other thing. But then they found that, that covering the eye will delay the healing more than if we leave it open and just get away from dust. Another example is putting infants on their tummies. Before, they used to put babies on their back. And there were many cases of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, recorded. Why? Because the baby vomited, and then he aspirated his vomitus, and he died while the parents were asleep. So some doctors advise mothers to put their babies on their tummies. But after a review, a review of mortalities, they found that the number of kids dying after applying this new recommendation has been double than the number of dying when they were back. So they have adopted a new thing called back to back. So they put their kids back in their back with some advices to bob up the baby before putting them to sleep. Also about the example of thalidomide, thalidomide and arthrogibesis. After World War II, millions of people lost their lives. Hundreds of millions were injured. Others were pushed in, out of their homes. So people were unable to sleep. So a drug called thalidomide was prescribed to help people sleep during nighttime. And after taking this drug, many people noticed that their nausea and desire to vomit have stopped. So some doctors uh, thought we can use this for some people who complain of this nausea and desire to vomit. And there was an Australian doctor who said, I can use it for my pregnant women who suffer from this nausea and vomiting. And then he started prescribing this drug to them and other doctors in other countries, when they saw the amazing effect of it in stopping nausea and vomiting, they start prescribing it to their pregnant patients. 
But this Australian doctor was an honest doctor. He started following up his patients and he noticed that many of his patients end up giving delivery to babies without limbs, with arthrogabesis. And after that, he had this strong linkage between this drug, thalidomide and anthrogibosis, and he stopped it. And also we have the drug known to be the drug of choice for uh, influenza, which was also made by Gilead in, I think in 2000. And then it was prescribed for, for avian flu and, and uh, swine flu. But then a comparison of results to paracetamol found this drug was not superior in any aspect than paracetamol, except on the cost of it. One course of Tamiflu costs around $100. One course of paracetamol for 10 days costs less than half a dollar. And lastly is the arrhythmia drug uh, called flicanide. Uh, a drug by the name flicanide was discovered to stop arrhythmia. And people with arrhythmia were dying sometimes from fatal arrhythmia. So they prescribed this drug and this drug worked like magic. It stopped all sorts of arrhythmia. And to prove their concept, the manufacturer did a, uh, what you call it crossover study. So a patient takes flicanide, no more arrhythmia. It stops taking flicanide, arrhythmia comes back. Takes flicanide, no more arrhythmia, and so on and so forth. So the drug was named as a drug of choice to treat cardiac arrhythmias. But a review of mortality after that found that people who died with the drug are more than double the people who died without the drug. So they found that this drug was killing more patients due to sudden cardiac arrest more than the arrhythmia itself. And now it is not prescribed for everybody with arrhythmia, only for a peculiar category of patients who are suffering from this. So to learn new information about medicine, we have two strategies. It's either the Bosch strategy or the Paul strategy. The Bosch strategy is just like when you are <clears throat> signing in to a website or to a journal or to a medical uh, organization, and they will keep sending you up emails every day about new information, okay? So the only thing you will get is your inbox in your email will be completely full with information. Some of it might be useful. Most of it is not useful to you. And the, and the other way of learning information is by the poll strategy. You need this information and you take it when you need it. So this way of learning is just in time. I need to know the valid evidence for this patient. So there is a way to, to learn this. But in the previous way of learning, I have 100 emails. Maybe I will find my answer in one article or in one email. So now, how to practice evidence-based medicine? We have five steps of practicing evidence-based medicine. First, we need to ask specific questions to reach the required information. Second, we need to acquire this best available evidence to answer this question. Third, we need to appraise the answer that we have found regarding its validity, its impact, its applicability. Then we make decision. And fourth, we need to apply the evidence we found on our patients and other patients. And finally, we need to evaluate the whole process once again. So asking specific question, we use the PICO format. The PICO stands, the P stands for patient or problem. What are we trying to address? What's the problem? What's the gender of the patient? What's the age of the patient? Why stands for the intervention or the area of interest? What will you do for this patient? Is it drug, is it surgery, is it diet, is it exercise? Against what you're comparing to do your intervention? Is it against placebo doing nothing or against the gold standard or the, against the usual care? 
And the O stands for outcome measure. What are you going to look for after administering this? Are you looking for shorter hospital stay or faster recovery or uh, faster fracture healing or fewer, fewer risk of hospitalization or more death or less death? So here I placed three questions that I have formulated. In a patient, in a five-year-old child with conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis and or five-year-old child are my patients. With topical antibiotics, which is the intervention, compared to knee treatment. So I'm here comparing, prescribing antibiotic for the eye compared to no treatment, just clean it with just water. Lead to quicker symptom relief or not? This is one question. A second question is, in a 50-year-old woman with Bell's palsy, as you can see in the, in the picture, does steroid compared to no steroid lead to faster return of facial symmetry? So am I going to give steroid or not giving steroid? Which is better for the patient? A third question, in a patient with soft tissue injury, the use of clean non-sterile gloves for laceration repair as compared to using sterile gloves will lead to more infections or not. If using non-sterile gloves will not lead to more infections, then every day I'm going to save tens of thousands of gloves that is costly and sometimes cause allergy for the medical staff. So every kind of question, you need to choose a specific study design to answer it. So if your question about diagnosis, you need to look for prospective blind comparison against gold standard. If you're looking for therapy, then you need to look for RCT studies. If you're looking for prognosis about uh, something that will happen in the future, you need to look for a cohort study. If you're looking for harm, or prevention, then you look for RCT. So everything, there is a specific study design that is more favorable than the others. The second thing is you need to acquire the best available evidence with which you answer your question. So everybody will start looking for answers, but those with uh, knowledge about evidence-based medicine will find the answers quickly and safely and from the ease of their desktop. Here I put two levels of classification of evidence. First by Joanna Briggs Institute, and it classifies evidence from uh, A, Roman uh, one to Roman four. One stands for evidence obtained from studies and meta-analysis in randomized control trials. Evidence level two at least comes from one well-designed evidence originated from RCT. Level three, evidence from non-randomized then goes lower and lower, uh, case control, cohort studies, uh, multiple time series. And evidence level four comes from clinical experience. So again, just to remind our lovely audience, uh, expert opinion is always in the bottom. So you cannot just trust what's being said to you by your seniors. You have really to appraise it and uh, make sure that uh, the data on it is valid and trustworthy. Here is the classification from the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford. Evidence 1A is coming from systematic review with homogeneity, means that the study which, which were included in that systematic view are homogeneous. There is not high degree of heterogeneity in it. And these studies are all belong to randomized control trial. 1B is individual randomized control trial with narrow uh, confidence interval. It means the trustworthiness of confidence interval is high. And so on and so forth. I don't want to go into these details because uh, uh, we have limited time remaining. 
So where do I look for evidence? I need to look at least in two of these websites. One is Cochrane Database or Cochrane Library, up to date, clinical evidence, trap database, PubMed, Web of Science, Starbus, Embers. If I'm looking for a specific subject that belongs to paramedical or allied health professions like physiotherapy, nursing, psychology, then there are other websites like PsychoInfo and Sina Health. Third, I need to appraise the evidence that I've found. And before appraising evidence, you have to know whether the answer you've found belongs to filtered information or unfiltered information. Unfiltered information belongs to any research design that you heard of, whether case control studies, cohort studies, randomized trials, case series, case reports, anything. This is considered to be a primary research and need to be appraised first. But if you what you found is filtered information, meaning it is an article synopsis, it is an evidence synthesis, it is a systematic review, then this means that the evidence he, here has been appraised and some other experts, people who are have allocated their time and their efforts to do it for you, and they just give it to you ready-made. So it's up to you just to chew it. You don't have to, to exert much effort in abrasion. But you have to take into consideration that those people are working day and night to filter this information, so they need to be paid. So those websites that offer you filtered information, they need subscription. And to be honest with you, this subscription is not high. It's it, uh, worth every penny spent on it. But if you want to appraise uh, research designs or research articles, you yourself, there are four main areas or four main issues that you need to look at. First is the relevance. Is the question in that study similar to the question you want to answer? Is the population in that study that you found similar to the population that you're going to treat? Is the setting of that study similar to the setting to the population or patient you're going to treat? If yes, then well and good. Second is the validity. It is the extent to which the results are free from bias. And bias is any systematic error that makes the results skewed towards favoring some outcome against the other outcome. Maybe I have selected my patients in my study to suit that intervention. Let's say uh, I want to test a new antihypertensive agent and I have put all young, uh, young patients in my in new experimental uh, drug and all the old people in the uh, standard care. So it is expected that those youngsters will benefit better than uh, the old population. And the same thing, maybe I will have measurement bias when I'm measuring, when I'm, when I'm measuring from uh, the outcome from my patients, I, I have inter-rater variability. Hello? Uh, or I have analysis bias. When I analyze the data, I'm biased towards uh, certain intervention against the other intervention. Consistency is the extent to which the results are similar across different analysis in the study and other studies. Of course, when we say that, let's say, vitamin D can improve, let's say, uh, patient's immunity, or vitamin C can uh, shorten the duration of flu, let's say. And here I have hundreds of papers stating this uh, conclusion and one paper saying, no, 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 vitamin C will along, uh, lengthen the hospital stay. Then I have to disregard this uh, odd finding. And then I need to look for the importance and significance of the results. Taking in one aspect, the p-value, but p-value 
means nothing if the whole context is not supportive of the significance. And also I have to look for the confidence interval for the number needed to treat and the number needed to hold. Maybe I'll just take 20 seconds to explain these two things. The number needed to treat and the number needed to harm. Uh, let's say um, I have here uh, a new vaccine, a new vaccine, and I have this vaccine. I need to, to give it to 100 patients in order to prevent, let's say, uh, 200, uh, so, sorry, uh, to prevent 80 in new cases of COVID-19. If I need to give this number to a higher patients, to a higher number of patients, then the drug is less effective. Instead of giving it to, to 100, I'm, I'm supposed to give it to 200 to, to prevent COVID infection among 80, then this is less effective vaccine than if, let's say, I give it to 100 and prevent it on 80. If I'm talking about number, uh, a number needed to harm, then how many patients do I need to treat before I see the undesirable effect of my intervention or side effects? So here I need to look for an intervention with higher number needed to harm before I see the, the, the side effect, which will be more favorable. Meaning, if I'm going to give a certain drug, a certain antibiotic, certain drug, and if I give it to 100 patients, I will have 20 patients with hepatotoxicity. But another drug, if I give it to 300, 300, I will have 20 patients with hepatotoxicity. Which one do you think is better? It's the second one. It's the one which I give it to 300 patients and have only 20 patients with hepatotoxicity. The final uh, thing is to apply the evidence on my patients. So to apply my this finding on my patient, I need to ask myself, what do this results mean on average? And what do they mean for my patient in particular? And based on this finding, is this intervention feasible on my setting? Let's say uh, the Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine, it's 95% effective, but it's not feasible in our setting of Gaza because it needs to be minus 70 or minus 80 uh, Celsius uh, freeze. So we don't have such setting. So this kind of intervention is not suitable. Maybe we will have the Moderna, maybe we'll have the AstraZeneca. And also, do I have the experience to provide such intervention? If yes, then I will apply it and I will use my best research evidence that I have found. I will use my expertise. And after agreeing with the patients, I will provide this. If I am giving this to my patient, then I'm applying evidence-based medicine. And the final thing is after certain period of time, let's say every six months, every year, I need to evaluate the whole process from A to Z to see if there is a new information coming in, if there is a better evidence coming in, if there is a more valid information coming in, I need to adopt it, incorporate it into my decision. Final advice is, Always be ready to surrender to a higher level of evidence when it becomes available. Do not be entrenched with what, with what has been done for years. A bad idea done by many people for a long period of time is will remain and still a bad idea. Not everything that it claims to be evidence-based is really evidence-based. Retrospective studies usually are weaker than prospective studies. Always your use a higher quality resources, such as the Cochrane, up to date, clinical club, clinical evidence, info retriever, and so on, so forth. And finally, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the talk with us. So hi, everyone. I'm uh, Loyal Bacconi, and I'm a um, medical doctor. I graduated from the uh, Kutz University, uh, Al-Azhar branch, and uh, then I did um, a one year uh, work there internship in Palestine, Gaza. And also I worked in the Islamic University Faculty of Medicine and as a, a teaching assistant and then moved to Germany. I did a master's degree in clinical epidemiology and then to Australia 
did PhD in evidence-based practice and now working as an academic faculty and medical researcher at the Institute for Evidence-Based Healthcare. Um, and thanks for the invitation, Oxbell, for doing this um, uh, lectures this week and next week for the research fellowship. So some of these early slides will be uh, somehow duplicate or confirming what uh, Dr. Hamis has just said. Uh, so bear with me. So let's say that you had the patient coming to you um, to your clinic um, with asking you that um, he has or she has a, a high risk for type 2 diabetes mellitus, and she has coming up with this news article in the, in, in the, in the newspaper that they have found that the whey protein could help reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. What do you think that Australian researchers believe they have discovered a way to help compact and reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes? And um, she's asking you, should I start using the whey protein for my patient? with diabetes. What do you think based on that news article? Will you um, encourage these patients to um, try, uh, give it a try for the whey protein? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, and then you read, complete reading uh, the article and you found that this is eminent prof professor has discovered that the whey protein, which is found in the milk, has a positive impact on the pancreatic cells and help them to raise more insulin. So there is a strong pathophysiological mechanism suggesting that this is, could be truly reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So at this stage, will you a little bit more convinced that this could be a good option to start um, prescribing or suggesting your patients to start with the whey protein for reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus. But you completed the last few lines and you found that this study is based on um, work done in the mice and just an eight week period of time. So that will destroy all, <laughs> destroy all what you have built on because it's just in the mice and it's just for this very short limited um, uh, time period. And there's a hashtag or Twitter handle and a Twitter just say in mice for all these articles or all these studies that build that um, catchy headlines uh, but just in animal studies. And this is not the way that we should uh, practice um, clinically because we it's very difficult to rely on animal studies. And as uh, Dr. Hamis said, this is, could be on the bottom of the uh, evidence hierarchy. So is it really matter, matter to um, practice this, the whole evidence-based medicine? Is that really matter? And what the people before the evidence-based medicine, what the people um, has been doing. Um, so is it, isn't that we could just practice based on the clinical knowledge that we uh, accumulated through the formal education? Maybe, uh, yes, maybe no. There's an example of this hormonal replacement therapy. So in the um, mid 19s, uh, 1940s, 1950s, what suggested that the hormone replacement therapy could replace the estrogen um, uh, the like anti-aging effect for the woman, especially the postmenopausal woman. And there is a lot of suggestion why not those women should be prescribed with these hormone replacement therapy to decrease their myocardial infarction and cardiovascular events. And that was a common standard, like a, a practice, common practice at that um, time period until the Women Health Initiative, which is one of the largest randomized control trial that has been conducted, evaluating the hormone replacement therapy and whether that's could reduce the cardiovascular event and not. But they found that um, the hormone replacement therapy couldn't uh, reduce the cardiovascular event. Instead, it has some harmful effects. So it could increase the cardiovascular event in those women that had uh, received the hormone replacement therapy. So if you have uh, went through the medical school in the 1940s and 1950s, the clinical knowledge that you will receive at that time will be you should prescribe any postmenopausal woman with hormonal replacement therapy. But after 15 years, after new trials, a new evidence coming through, that will no longer withstand. And there's a common nation by, I think by David Suckett, that's um, uh, the gentleman at the first slide of Dr. Hamis said, half of the evidence is outdated in five years. So within your medical education, half of the evidence will be outdated. And the problem that we don't know which half is outdated. That's why you need these skills um, uh, to know which half, similar to the iPhone. Um, 
Another way, shall we just uh, rely on clinical experience and the clinical expertise, someone practicing for 20 years, let's just rely and copy that practice um, without looking at the evidence. And one of the examples that Dr. Khamis mentioned is there's um, a very eminent clinical expert, uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock, um, who has wrote a very well popular um, uh, book for parents and clinicians who is dealing with the babies. And in that, um, uh, he suggested that babies should be uh, put on sleep on their um, on their uh, tummies or on their fronts, not on the back, because that's it will be easier. A lot, a, a little bit of uh, bath physiology, a little uh, it's be, it will be easier for the vomiting if they vomit, not to shock with this vomitus, and also to avoid any flattening of the head. But after uh, a proper systematic review and empirical evidence, they found that instead putting the babies or infants to sleep on their front um, has led to over 10,000 infant deaths because of the sudden infant death syndrome in the UK and more than uh, 50,000 in Europe, in the USA and Australasia. So this uh, well-intentioned advice has been turned into very harmful um, effects into our patients. So experience can just mean that making the same mistake again and again with increasing confidence. So what about the bath physiology or the disease mechanism? Can we rely on the disease mechanism or the bath physiology? And that's again, one of the examples that Dr. Hamis mentioned. So um, after my post myocardial infarction, there's a common arrhythmia uh, that's happening. And a common practice, there is an arrhythmia. Let's give this arrhythmia antiarrhythmic drug. And it was a common practice because of that bath physiology and some early studies that has been conducted. Um, and the mechanism behind that, this arrhythmia could, this antiarrhythmic drug could reduce the death and poor outcomes. However, after a, a randomized trial has been conducted, they found instead of that reduction um, in the death, there's an increase in the death. Although the arrhythmia itself has decreased, but the death has increased in those patients that received the antiarrhythmic drug. So relying only on the bath physiology and disease mechanism in treating our patients will not be um, uh, enough. What about reading all the articles that's in your specialty or in your, um, in your field? And again, there's a lot of articles. There's an exponential growth of the number of articles that's published every day. And even in the number of randomized trial or systematic review, and it has been estimated that around a clinician, if you would like just to read the articles in your own specialty, let's say, for example, you would like to specialize in ear, nose, throat, ENT, you will need about 19 articles to 20 articles per day to read. And that's a lot of articles to read uh, per day, especially with a busy clinician. And the problem that's the number of articles that's uh, published, there is a lot of uh, article that has been published of low clinical relevance and a lot of article of low validity, the quality of the article of, um, of low quality. And there's only a few articles that have high validity, high um, clinical re relevance that can change the practice. And you would like these skills that you can detect, easily detect, efficiently detect these kind of articles. And that's what's um, uh, my uh, mentor, Paul Glasier, has uh, described that 21st century clinician who cannot critically read a study is as unprepared as one who cannot take a blood pressure examine or examine the cardiovascular system. So we need these kind of skills um, that efficiently uh, read the literature, interpret the finding, and apply it in, in a clinical practice. So a little bit of a history of the randomized control trial. So this uh, gentleman is, um, is Captain James Cook, and this is the Lord George Anson. And there is one, um, um, one thing uh, uh, overlapping between those uh, two gentlemen is they both did circumnavigation around the world. Uh, one in the seven, both of them around the same time period, just 30, 30 years um, between both of them. But in this, in this answer, 1,300 of his crew member has died out of the 2,000 has died because of some symptoms like um, gum bleeding, uh, some kind of um, other symptoms and end up with heart failure and death. However, in 
James Cook, only four of the 118 has died with these symptoms. So there is a massive discrepancies between the two circumnavigation, although there's only 30 years um, time difference. So what's the reason behind of that? So we know that this is scary, but what's why there's such a um, huge difference in the number of digits between these two circumnavigation? And that has been attributed by James Lind, who in about 1750, 1747, he, he was a junior doctor, doctor in the army in the British Navy. And what he was, he, he did uh, one of the earliest randomized controlled trials. So he had 12 sailors with scurvy and he divided this um, sailor with scurvy into uh, six group. Some of them giving, giving them oranges and lemons, some of them cedar, some of them sea waters and other different um, treatment. And he followed up these patients and after few weeks, he found that those who received the oranges and lemons, the citrus, has uh, performed very well compared to the other who has um, deteriorated and some of them died. And that's uh, considered one of the earliest randomized controlled trial uh, that has been conducted. And based on that, we now we know that, sca uh, that scurvy could be treated with, uh, with vitamin C or attributed to the vitamin C deficiency. And another thing that this gentleman has uh, done, the James Land, is he, he has conducted one of the earliest systematic review. So these six treatment is based on um, based on systematically searching of all kind of evidence that has been conducted in the Navy, the British Navy, and found that this kind of treatment has been experimented here and there. And based on that, he tried, he did like kind of a systematic review and then he applied the first randomized control trial that we are aware of. And he documented that in this, um, in this book. And that's the history, but now we have similar, exactly the same thing with, with the COVID-19. So for example, the hydroxychloroquines, early in the pandemic, we found that there's lots of media attention that hydroxychloroquine is very, um, a strong promising drug that could treat patients with COVID-19. Um, and then there is a controversial a controversy around whether that could be beneficial or not. And that's a lot of um, this controversy, especially when um, some of the politicians, when the politics uh, or, or the policymakers coming into the way um, of medicine. Um, and there's a lot of increase in the number of these drugs that has been sold in the market um, after some of these remarks. However, after uh, a careful randomized trial, the recovery, uh, they found that um, uh, the hydroxychloroquine is no longer effective uh, in treating patients with the COVID-19. So only when there is a randomized controlled trial, which is considered the gold standard for, um, for intervention study or treatment studies or question, has been conducted and the results found that there is no effect for the hydroxychloroquines. Only after that, we know for somehow for more confidence or confident that um, there is no place for hydroxychloroquine. Before that, observation study could give us a little bit uh, low quality evidence um, to base our treatment on. So just the two questions in the chat were, um, first, this was, I think in reference to Dr. Hermes's talk, but I think either of you could answer. What's different between retrospective and prospective trials? Okay, okay. Uh, retrospective is looking on what the findings of uh, any research that's done backward. I mean, when we do retrospective research, we don't follow patients, let's say I start now in February 1, 2021, then I follow them up until let's say March, June, August, and so on and so forth. This, I'm following my patient, I'm testing them, I'm measuring their, their list parameters and recording, analyzing. But retrospective, the patient has been taking this drug, let's say in the past year, then I'm looking in their files, what the drug has done to their blood pressure in the past year. Uh, uh, it's 10 years from now, what kind of risk factors they have been exposed to more than others. Uh, 20 years ago, what kind of surgery they have 
uh, underwent, which might affect their future. So retrospective is looking something in the past. Uh, uh, prospective or uh, forward looking, it's more, more trustworthy. Why? Because you cannot always trust uh, something in the past, maybe like our situation, filing system is very poor. So most of the time, the information there is incomplete. Sometimes maybe the patient have taken this drug, but it's not written there. So you will presume that the patient hasn't taken it because it's not there, but he has taken it. Uh, another thing, the issue of recall, something when you are asking patients about something in the past, especially when you're doing case control studies and you're asking patients about what kind of exercise he has been doing for the last year and how many cigarettes has been be smoking over the 10 years or 20 years, then the patient will not recall everything. So in general, retrospective study is always weaker than prospective studies, but this doesn't always mean that any study that is prospective is better than, because if it's prospective, but it is full with bias and uh, with, with uh, favorism and maybe uh, leading questions, then I might screw the data and screw the results like uh, my dear friend, Luai mentioned. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and then, the other question um, was from Mr. Maynard. He says, thank you, my close friend Hamis, for a wonderful talk. I have a question. How well have the principles of EBM been applied to management of COVID, particularly face masks, lockdown, social distancing? Um, I guess yeah. that this kind of relates to um, yeah. what Loai was thank touching you on. Very much. Well. Uh, this is a very, very good question, actually. Uh, one, one thing, actually, I have to admit, because this pandemic has been all we there for one year. So just imagine in one year, and at the moment we have more than 150,000 published articles regarding COVID-19. 150,000 articles, imagine, this is huge. But so far, so far, the evidence, all evidence, all evidence, I mean, there is a unanimous, uh, uh, agreement on this, whether you are talking about studies in England or in Australia or in Germany, all of them uh, have proven that social distancing is one effective way to decrease the infection. And this has been proven with practical uh, examples, whether in laboratory or in real life. Another thing, the masking, uh, it, this also has been shown to be very effective in preventing uh, uh, infection and also the, the third one is uh, yeah uh, the lockdown the lockdown it has shown to be effective but when it comes to school children they found that locking down school children especially the the younger generation it has about 1.3 percent only of the total infections were caused by kids so it didn't make much difference uh, on that aspect but for all other uh, parameters taken, uh, whether it is social distancing, uh, masking, and uh, hygiene, it's all proven to be effective. And actually, there was one study in, conducted in Australia uh, by uh, a famous uh, foundation, I forget the name, but they have done this, uh, this in, inside the laboratory, well kept, uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, Every, every possible confounders was taken care of. And they found that, yes, uh, masking, masking is more effective. That's right. And uh, uh, wiping the, the, the surface, especially glass and stainless steel, is very effective in reducing the load, the viral load of, on these surfaces and might minimize the infection or cross infection. And in, in most studies, actually I have read more than 50 studies and all of them confirmed the same finding that they are really effective. Maybe I would like to add about the uncertainty. I don't think that, uh, what I'm thinking that we haven't been done as evidence-based practice community or evidence-based medicine community. We haven't done a great job in how to deal with the uncertainty of the evidence and to interpret the uncertainty to the, to the clinicians, to the researcher, and also to the public. Um, so for example, in the issue of the mask, there's some kind of uncertainty in the evidence. And um, however, 
translating that into policy recommendation and then translating that uncertainty to clinicians, to researchers and to the public, uh, I think they could be doing a little bit more better. Um, but sometimes for policymaker, we, will, we, we have to deal or we have to rely or base our decision on not the highest quality of evidence. For example, the mask, there is no randomized control trial or probably conducted. There are a few, a couple of randomized contract, conducted uh, trials about the face mask and the community. But we have to deal with the pandemic and um, base our decision on the other kind of evidence. Yeah, great. Um, thank, thank you both. Um, and then the last question I can see on the chat at the moment is, um, I think with regards to the second talk, um, do you prefer 0% heterogeneity value for the studies, including in meta-analysis, to which range it can be accept to which range can it be accepted? Yep. So I think um, I'm referring to the I square test uh, or the I square, the quantification of the heterogeneity. Uh, if, if you have a zero percent heterogeneity, that's mean that uh, you have very homogeneous uh, group of studies. Um, I think the acceptable, the Cochrane, which is the gold standard for the applying the systematic review methodology, accepting about 15, 15 um, sorry, 50 to 70 percent heterogeneity, more than 90 percent, there's very high heterogeneity, and you have to, um, there will be a little bit uh, uncertainty in that evidence, think that kind of evidence. However, take into consideration that you have to explore the heterogeneity. What's, what, why the reason of the heterogeneity? Maybe if you are planning a subgroup analysis in advance, you have to think about what could be the subgroups that's causing the heterogeneity. And there is other statistical method that you can apply like meta regression analysis in which you can find the, explore the causes of these heterogeneity. Is it okay if I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead, please do. Hi, um, this is Jamana. I studied at Al Quds. Um, thank you for the amazing presentations. They're really helpful. Um, I have two questions. Um, when I was doing my clinical training, um, I noticed that sometimes um, older consultants would get a bit offended by, um, you know, younger doctors talking about newer research or evidence-based medicine, like they usually rely on their expertise, which is um, understandable since they've been practicing for a long time. But how would you go about a situation like this? And my second question is, um, you mentioned that there's a really increasing number of publications. Um, does that mean that the quality of research is maybe less or it's a good thing because more people are doing research? And that's it, thank you. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, the dean of the Faculty of Medicine in Harvard Medical School have said to his student the same, same statement that was uh, mentioned by Dr. Guyet and uh, uh, Luai, that uh, he mentioned to his students in their third year medical schooling that by the time you are graduate medical students, half of what you have learned will turn to be wrong. And that is not the problem. The problem is none of your professors who taught you knows which half is that. That's actually the big issue. Uh, most of the time we have been brought by a didactic way of teaching. I mean, uh, that's what you have to do. If you meet a patient with a stroke, first thing you order CT. If no, no uh, hemorrhage, if no hemorrhage, then you start this streptokinase. If with hemorrhage, stop streptokinase, watch the patient for 24 hours. We're not leaving the student to think in a critical way, in a critical manner, to learn themselves. And actually, it has been proven that when I learn things in the proper way, with some guidance from the senior, the, the, result, the result of this will be long lasting learning process. It's not like when I'm just teaching you to do something that's proven to be wrong. And sometimes uh, doctors from all schools and doctors who has learned the medicine the old way uh, will tend to stick to their opinions because they have been doing this for let's say 50 years. And here comes the little young lad saying that I think there's something wrong in what you've said. 
or maybe at least there's something new that contradicts what you are advising. And here comes la the lash out from this senior uh, monster yeah. <laughs> against that yeah. uh, uh, helpless student. So I think you have to take it uh, little by little and it will be wonderful if you can start infiltrating these high ranking professors through journal clubs, through discussions, through conferences. And that's what actually we have uh, done here in Gaza Strip. I still remember in 2008, when I started to prepare for my first lecture ever in Gaza Strip about evidence-based medicine, I was accused to be a man who brings a new religion. Oh, who's man, who's this man who's trying to change our religion? He's telling us that what we're doing is not correct and what we're doing is, is out of the norm. Then I started to show them little by little that what you're doing might, might have some bitter impact if you change it a little bit. And here's the evidence. And if we look together in the Cochrane Library, we find, then they start, oh my God, I mean, this man is saying something really new and I think we have to follow him. And step by step, really, now if you attend all our conferences, all doctors, seniors and youngsters are proud that we are practicing evidence-based medicine. And thanks to Dr. Khamis who brought this to us and thank you. Thank you. So I think it, it really, it's really hard really to, to implement this right away and to force people to change their practices, which has been done for years and years, all of a sudden, because this ego is very strong inside each and every one of us. So we have to really teach this ego to go down a little bit. Dr. Lai, if you um, want to give her uh, uh, another- I, I, was, I was thinking of, especially the journal club. I think the journal, that's, uh, first of all, that's very challenging situations yeah. to have a senior that's not supporting of the evidence-based medicine. That's very challenging, but it's also not that uncommon. So it's common. Um, hopefully it will be less common uh, nowadays. Um, but I think the journal club is very um, uh, good idea to start with discussing the case, discussing some kind of the evidence, what's uh, this senior practice and what could be other practices and see um, if there could be a discussion. Um, I don't think that's from the first time it will be a breakthrough, but hopefully uh, by the time and by your champion, by being the evidence-based medicine champion in your practice, that could um, change the way, not for you only, but for the next generations. Exactly, exactly. And With another, regard advice, to... another advice actually is, why don't you start, I mean, uh, some many, many audits, many audits of certain topics in your, in your hospital, in your, uh, maybe we've started it for third year students in the pharmacology about certain drugs. And we ask them to go and, okay, let's, this drug is prescribed for acute uh, sinusitis, or this drug has been prescribed for preterm labor. So I, we send the students to the hospital and collect the data from 100 records. So we don't want to go near the patient and interfere with the senior's work. Just go to the report after taking prior permissions and all support. And then here is the work that has been done on 100 patients. And then we go and pick up the best guideline from trustworthy sources like the Cochrane, like Trip Database, like NICE and SIGN and others. And then we summarize what's the evidence in that protocol and compare it to our local practice. And then we present this to our seniors. And then our senior says, oh my God, there's a big difference between what we're doing and what they're doing. Can we improve it, sir? Yes, we will do together and improve it. So step by step, we have encouraged our students to, the, to do this. And till this moment, we have finished almost 150 audits in different topics. And uh, I think there has been a major change in the atmosphere of acceptance of evidence base, and not only evidence base, but acceptance of being uh, open to appraisal, that I'm not perfect. I'm a person, I'm a human being, and I can be wrong, I can be correct, I can be, uh, some people might be more superior to me. So that's the main achievement that we have done here 
uh, together with uh, our great uh, beloved friend uh, Luai and others, uh, and uh, also the support from my dear friend, uh, Dr. Nick Maynard. I mean, uh, people from Oxford and from uh, Scotland, we've been doing lots of, lots of work together, and I think there is a momentum of change here. And the same thing, hopefully, when the, when the way will be open between Gaza and West Bank, uh, we hope to extend it more and more. I was invited to give a workshop in An Najah University, but due to this COVID and the closure, we couldn't, but we have done it in Berzet University. We hopefully will expand it more and more to other uh, universities in the West Bank, inshallah. So I don't think there's any more questions for now, obviously, always pop them in the chat. Um, so Loai, if you want to do the next bit of your chat, of your talk that you had um, planned, um, that would be fab. Um, yep. So let's take this an exa uh, this example, this case. So George is a 56-year-old man who asked about a knee hole uh, arthroscopic surgery to help reducing the pain he has experiencing from osteoarthritis in his right knee for the last two years. He say that the surgery magically improved his sister's knee pain. What do you think? You looked up the evidence and um, you found this this article that has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008, looking at the arthroscopic surgery for um, osteoarthritis of the knee. And here in the um, y-axis, this is a pain score, the WOMAC score. The higher the score, uh, the higher the pain. And this is the month. So from zero month, this is the baseline, and three months, six months, 12, and one and a half year. And as you can see, that's the arth arthroscopic surgery Great, greatly reduced the, the, uh, the amount uh, of pain. So starting from about 1,000, 1,100 to about 800. So about 30% um, reduction in the pain score over one and a half year. So it seems that this is uh, a very good uh, solution for his knee pain. So what do you think? Will you um, refer this patient uh, to the arthroscopic surgery? to do an orthoscopic surgery to the orthopedic. You well, complete so reading the... That, um, I can read out the chat for you if that helps. Someone said, first, we should look and see if he is a good candidate for the surgery. So you completed um, reading uh, the whole uh, article. Um, and what you found that, you found another like, figure for that, uh, similar to that one, and you found the control who has been randomized uh, to take no surgery or to none surgery. And you found a similar slope. So starting with high 1,000, uh, 1,100, 1,200, and then after one and a half year, almost the same. So there's all, also the same 30 to 35% reduction in the pain over one half year. So you are a little bit surprised. So it's not that uh, effective as you were um, uh, thought about before. So what's now, will you go for the surgery or not? And the question, what could be the, why there could be an improvement even in the control, those who have received nothing um, over time? What could be possible reason for that? One of the reasons, something called the placebo effect, and that's um, a very common, that's people that um, thought that they have received a medical intervention, especially if you have a subjective outcome like the pain, they usually estimated or thought that they have an improvement. The other um, reason for that improvement in the control, the natural history, some of the disease works and wanes. So it could be one at one time of point that there's a, a huge, um, and there's um, uh, uh, high pain and then there is low pain. So there is a wax and wane in the natural history of the disease. And finally, there's statistical phenomena called the regression to the mean. And we will do some kind of um, uh, a group class exercise for that. So who would like to be an ortho orthopedic um, surgeon here? So now you can be a consult consultant or orthopedic consultant by doing um, any arthroscopic surgery. 
So I will share with you um, an Excel spreadsheet. And what we, we would like to do, you have this patient and we will throw a dice, an, an online dice, dice and calculate the patient's score. And the score will be um, between two and 12. So we will throw two dice and the score will be between two and 12. And if the dice score, which is the sum of the two dice more than 10 or equal 10, that's mean we would like to do and go for the surgery. So refer to this patient to the surgery and follow up this patient after 12 months. So you'll, ha you'll have this Excel sheet similar to that. And we will see at the baseline and after 12 months, which mean after the surgery. Um, I'll share with you um, a shared Excel um, sheet and also um, an online dice and see. So just I'll remind you uh, what we would like to do is just I would like from you to um, to throw the dice to throw the dice and see, um, throw the dice, what's the score, the sum of the two dice together, put it in the initial, and then if it's 10 or more, that's mean yes for the arthroscopic surgery. And if it's yes, that's 10 or more, then do it again, through, through the dice again, and see how it goes. So just we'd like to have about 10 to 20, at least surgeries. Yeah, but I have two in the chat, five and seven, so there's no. Okay, anyone have, ah, uh, there's, um, there's, so we have one good 10 and then five, and there's another one, Hassan, good 12. So what's the second one, Hassan? Have you got it? Ah, uh, so. So I'm good one, 12, and then six. So I'll maybe I'll write that um, for you. So as you can see, at least we have two to three individuals that start with 10 or more, but when they did it again, they have much more, five, six, and nine at the second row. And that's what could happen here. That's what's called the regression to the mean. So as you can see here, here in this study, they did um, a baseline assessment. And what they could have done at this time point that based on this baseline score, they have recruited the patient. Any patient with a low score excluded from the study and they have just selected the people that have a high score at the beginning. And that's, so by following up over time, even without any intervention, this selecting those who are at the extreme, either high or low, and um, could end up with averaging to the mean or something called to the regression to the mean. So by selecting the people at this high, lower end or higher end and following up over time, even without any intervention, you could end up with regression to the mean. So improvement over time. So without having a control, a fair control, you could easily persuade, um, persuaded by any intervention thought to be or shown to be effective just because you have selected the patient at the right time point, either in the lower end or the upper extreme end, and then followed up over time without any real intervention as we have just um, has been seen here in the group exercise. We haven't done any uh, recruitment for the patient. We haven't done any arthro arthroscopic surgery and we haven't, haven't done any uh, follow up just by this throwing the dice, rolling the dice more and more, we get uh, an improvement in, our, in the pain of our patient. This is a comic for that. So the question is, is it always necessary to have a randomized control trials to evaluate an intervention? So um, to skydive, if you would like to throw yourself from um, uh, an airplane, would you like, would, do you need a parachute or not? So, but the, f the problem that's for medical intervention, usually it's not the case as a parachute. So um, most of the cases we need an randomized control trial. Another example for that. So look at this um, uh, randomized control trials or the, this study for the influence of the adherence to um, a drug clofibrate on mortality. 
so this is looking at those who have less than 80% adherence, more than 80 or equal 80% adherence. And as you can see, those who have low adherence to the um, clofibrate have about 25% mortality over five years. However, those who have a high adherence have only 15% mortality over five years. So that's given an indication this kind of a drug is very effective in reducing the cardiovascular mortality. Those who have high adherence have 15% compared to 25%. However, if you looked at those who, have, who are in placebo, you will find a similar result. 28% who have a low adherence to the placebo, as we know, that's have no effect. Um, compared to 15% who have high adherence to the placebo, that have no active intervention. So what could be the reason for that? Uh, this is something called the confounders. So here, the relationship between the adherence to the medication or the lack of adherence, the non-adherence to the medication, to the death due to cardiovascular event. And there could be something called the confounders. So for example, the smoking, those who are um, non-adherent to the medication, more likely to smoke, or in other term, less likely to quit smoking. And that's a very strong um, uh, relation factor to the uh, death due to cardiovascular disease. So that's something called the confounder. And the beauty of randomized control trial that distribute these confounders into those who are um, uh, between the intervention arms, including the placebo or the active intervention. And that's what the randomized trials are best mean to separate the signal, which is the true effect of the intervention from the noise, the other factors, including the confounders, those are, who are known or unknown to the researchers. So it's not always we need an RCT, but most often we need RCT. So just to uh, sum up with uh, an example for a systematic review. So this is one of the earliest published systematic review that have been conducted in, um, in the effect of radiation for post, post breast cancer surgery. Um, that has been conducted by author from Switzerland. So it has been used that after surgery, uh, breast cancer surgery, radiation is very recommended. And unless this um, study has been conducted and found uh, five randomized trials, and some of these randomized trials shown to be beneficial and some none, and when it has been meta-analyzed, they shown to be non-effective or sometimes harmful. And similar to that, also the, um, this is something called cumulative meta-analysis, especially this one in the right side called cumulative meta-analysis. So it's combining or pooling the effect of these randomized controlled trials uh, by going uh, downward on this table. And this is uh, a forest plot. Maybe next week we will come uh, to discuss that in more details. So this is a forest plot. You can think of a forest plot as a table, combined table and the figure. So this is the study name. So each line of those are um, a study or randomized trial could be. And this is the year of the publication or the conduction of this study. And this is the number of patients included in each trial. And here it is the uh, main finding of this trial. So for example, here, the odds ratio of this trial, DUA, is about, um, is about 0 0.48. And this is the line is the confidence interval. This is the lower confidence interval, and this is the higher confidence interval. Um, so this is individual uh, trials, and here is a cumulative. What they have done here is combining, um, so for example, here they combine doer 42 plus 23, and that's why the number of the patient here is 65. And as you can see, uh, that's um, here the p-value less than 0.05 by 1973. But they have still conducting more trials and more trials until 1988. So those, all of these trials could be saved and the patient that's included in these trials and out, uh, apart from these trials in the clinical practice could be saved if we have conducted a, uh, a systematic review of all the trials that have been published, for example, in 1975, because there could be an evidence that this treatment is effective and reducing the mortality in these patients. So that's why 
conducted systematic review could um, potentially uh, be saving lives if it has been conducted at the right time and found that treatment could be effective. And here is a little bit about the study design. I, um, I'm not sure if um, So maybe we, I can stop here and see if there's any question. Apologies, my um, my um, sound cut off just for a second there. Um, so apologies, I think I missed the last chunk. But yeah, um, if does anyone have any questions? Um, that um, yeah. So if there aren't any questions, um, thank you so much, Dr. Hamis. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lawai. Um, it's been really wonderful, and we're incredibly grateful um, for all your time and expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.